This is Linux Unplugged, episode 15, for November 19th, 2013. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's applying all its updates before we do our online banking every single week. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Welcome to episode 15, buddy. Thanks for having me. Now, I might not be um, I might not be giving the whole situation enough of its due, but I felt like that line right there was all we needed to say about this whole mint canonical controversy that erupted over the last couple of days. No kidding. You and I, here we go. We put out a nice Linux action show talking about OpenSUSE 13.1. <laughs> Meanwhile, the whole interwebs blows up because somebody three weeks ago on a mailing list said something, and then some other blog picks that up, and then Slashdot picks it up, and then it goes crazy, Matt. Well, it's almost like someone peed someone's Cheerios. I mean, really, it's like, come on, people. That would actually would have been more newsworthy. I actually it would have been, that, right. That yeah. would have been a more interesting topic. Uh, so, you know, this week, this week, it's interesting. I... Every now and then, I'm, I'm a bit of a slow man, and it takes me a while to realize that there's trends that happen in my inbox. We get lots of email from the Linux Action Show, and now this show as well, and a lot of new users that are looking to switch over to Linux and trying to trying to do their investigation, right? Trying to suss out the situation before they move over, they'll tune into the Linux Action Show, watch our how tos, watch uh, watch the news, just kind of get a feel for it, which totally makes sense because if I was switching to Linux back in the day when podcasts there weren't any podcasts really i mean i think there was some podcasts but there wasn't really any major linux podcasts and i would have totally loved that so it totally makes sense but what i what i failed to really notice is we've been getting a lot of emails about people switching from windows to linux and for a lot of the reasons you might suspect but there's a catch the switching is not going very well no, no. There's definitely some bumps in the road, some hurdles along the way and whatnot. Yeah, and, and some people are, are um, I think sometimes they're sold a bit of a, a bit of bag of goods, as it were, and they're kind of told, oh, switch, one-to-one replacements for your application, stability, security, blah, 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 and then they switch over, and they're, they end up maybe a little disappointed or something doesn't work the way they want. They end up, in the end disenfranchised and they go back to their windows and they huddle down and they stay there even longer and they say well i'll just live it out i'll just make it work over here on windows and so this week we're going to pull in our mumble room that's our online linux users group matt and i are going to kick around as longtime linux users and people who you know run multiple os's and help lots of people switch over to linux oh yeah i want to just you know we're just gonna have a frank discussion about the legitimate downsides if you are a full-fledged alternative operating system user and you're going to move over to linux there's some things that might not go very smooth, and I don't feel like there's enough places out there that are talking about that stuff, frankly. That's true. Actually, you know, I think you nailed the nailed it on the head there because I think the big piece of it with any distribution out there, especially the ones targeting newbies because they're the worst offenders and that they have this great experience waiting for people, but there's things that folks need to be aware of, and mm-hmm. it's not always – attractive from a visual standpoint or even from an experience experience standpoint to spend a lot of time talking about it because then you're detracting from the value of that particular well, distribution. And, you and know, that's where it gets funky for. And I can see where they're coming from, but still. It is know. hard. It is hard. You know what? Yeah. You, essentially what you're saying is that sometimes it's hard to talk about this kind of stuff. It is. Because, I don't know, you know, uh, you I mean, we can talk about it, but at the same time, I think if I'm running, you know, Jim Bob's, you know, uh, virtual Linux thing or whatever it is, and they're trying to switch to my distro, I'm, I'm a little gun shy about saying, oh, hey, by the way, here's a list of things that might stop you. That is, that's a funky spot to be. Well, and I'll be honest. I'm a Linux advocate, right? So yeah, I like exactly. talking about all of the stuff Linux does really well, right. right? And all the stuff that's really cool in Linux. I don't like to so much talk. I don't even like to focus on the stuff it does really bad. So uh, I've brought a third co-host to the show this week. His name is Woodenville Whiskey Bourbon. And uh, <laughs> actually, I picked up, you're talking for you. I figured I, I picked up this uh, this uh, bourbon whiskey from uh, 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 a low, you know, the, the the alcohol store, whatever you call it. And it is a local brew micro micro barreled. They call it, Matt. Have you ever heard of micro barreled micro no, barreled? Yeah, this is batch I, uh, number eight and bottle 115 handwritten on the bottle, too. I might add. I mean, I lived in a state with drive through liquor stores once, but I've not experienced a micro So, wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, for when you're too drunk to get out of your car. Yeah, so, right, right, yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> this is crafted entirely by hand in a small batches and aged to maturity in a new, charred American oak barrel. The yep. demanding process results in extremely rich and full-bodied bourbon whiskey. So I'm going to be drinking that today to help just bring out the honesty. That'll be my, that's my honesty <laughs> gateway this week. That works. That works. Still fighting through some of the tech issues we talked about last week on the show. Uh, I feel like I actually haven't really solved any of them, but I've learned like the new way to mitigate them to just create a new normal, which is a lot more work. Uh, takes about 45 minutes more, I've, which I've which I've whittled down from two hours. It takes about 45 minutes per show. I'm going to do some more work tonight, uh, so there's not going to be a live side bite tonight, but it'll be on her. She's going to do a hangout on her Google Plus page if you search for Heather on Google Plus. So you know, still going through a lot of um, a lot of troubleshooting there. Had some great suggestions from folks that have heard of different solutions to try it on Linux. Uh, you know, it's all of them I've heard of so far, but I still love getting those because, um, you know, if I could do if I could do the more the bulk of this on Linux, man, even if I had to do a bunch of work at this point, I'm already doing a whole bunch of work. So exactly, maybe and you I never know. Switch. There may be that eventual update to where you know the blurb comes out and you're like, oh hey, that they wasn't actually, there before. You, you know, know what? They, they just released an update today. I haven't tried it obviously because I didn't want to mm. mess with the show, but I'm going to install it tonight. So we'll see how it goes. Hmm. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, I wanted to get to some emails. We like to do the we like to do some follow up emails that are sort of continuing threads that we've had in previous shows here at the top of Unplug. That way, every show is we're not like Star Trek here on Unplug. And I love me some Star Trek, but Star Trek did the monster of the week. And that way, they could syndicate. <laughs> yep. We don't have we don't have those pressures here on the Unplug show. We like to do a continuing thread. So the Unplug show is an evolving storyline that takes place across a whole series of episodes. That way we make you listen to all of them. And uh, so going back a ways in our threads is uh, OwnCloud. We talked about OwnCloud a lot. Big OwnCloud fan. Um, I don't actually have an OwnCloud installation in production because I'm kind of waiting for a few things to kind of work themselves out, waiting for the next version. However, I know a lot of you out there have it. And we also have uh, the JB Cloud that people are experimenting with. So Richard wrote in, and uh, this one was a little bit of a warning to any of you running your own cloud installation on an SSD with trim enabled. He said, I had an existing home server running an established own cloud setup with a laptop running an own cloud client on my SSD. I upgraded my home server to Mint 15, reformat- reformatted my drives, and did a full reinstall of everything, including own cloud, no issues. On my laptop client, I tried to reestablish the own cloud sync and push my files back up to the server. It briefly showed a screen with two options, which I seem to remember asking which way to sync. It defaulted to the one where the local files would push to the server. The other option had a warning about data loss. Since I defaulted to the right value, I clicked next. I sat back with a smile, thinking, that was easy, until I got a (laughs) (laughs) notification. That's that's your first mistake right there, is you sat back, you got all cocky, your big old smile, and you thought, that was easy. That was pulled the staples right there. All right. It says, "Until until I got a notification that it was unable to delete a file that I was editing. What the F, he said? I quickly looked at my document structure, and it was gone. It synced my laptop to match the empty own cloud installation. Even if I did pick the wrong option, would a, are you sure you want to do this prompt, have been that hard? He's a little burned there. He said, I killed the power and booted up on a live disk and proceeded to try to get the data back. I ha- all my favorite go-tos for the data recovery, such as test disks, said it was unrecoverable. Then, as I dug deeper with Google's researching, undelete on extended 4 became clear. SSD with trim support means deleted files are unrecoverable. While this isn't a little side effect ever talked about, and why isn't this ever talked about in SSD conversations? I've never heard of this fact stated in last or text snap discussions with SSDs either. I would have been a little more careful had I known this when I switched to SSDs. I was using OwnCloud with its versioning as a backup strategy for documents not safe for Dropbox, consulting documents, uh uh-huh, and accepted some short-term risk to rebuild the server knowing that I had another copy on the laptop. This is exactly why the data must reside in three locations or else it doesn't exist. Two is not enough. I had an older outdated backup on a Windows Home server share, but about two months of documents that were not safe to sync to Dropbox were lost. Please remind users that switching to SSD means you lose the option of data recovery undelete with them. And you know, Boy. Richard, I've also heard the opposite side of that where um, because the way an SSD can kind of randomize the way it writes to a file, to a disk, um, in some cases when you try to do like a, an overwrite, sometimes it doesn't necessarily overwrite all the files. So we're still kind of learning really some of the challenges of SSDs because not everybody's switched over yet. So they don't have the mass adoption that, you know, a spinning disk does. That's um, true. But you know, Matt, uh, this is a hard thing because like, 
you want to have the master authority generally be the central server. That's generally how you avoid all these sync conflicts. But at the same time, and I'm and I'm this of course there's exceptions to this rule. Large media files, things like that, obviously are in limit. But for the most part, you, you know they were talking about it's uh, backing up in three locations. Out of the, one of those three locations needs to be offsite, whether that's mm-hmm. physically in a physical drive in another location or in the cloud or whatever you're comfortable with. But you know for something like this to happen, that's kind of the whole thing of it. As far as uh, something like this happening, yeah, I, I think that we need more SSD action uh, taking place out there so we can kind of gauge what other little surprises are out there. Yeah, and this is so. stuff we'll hit. You know, I'm, I'm pretty yeah, much all SSDs these days as I can. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll experiment more with this. Uh, you know, his point is well taken. And this is why I've... I, so here's... We had an email this week. said, Chris, you know, you talked about your backups, but you've never really said what you've landed on. Right. Um, and I really haven't landed on a good one except for anything that's important, I store in either BitTorrent Sync or directly on my Synology. Now, if I put it in BitTorrent Sync, it syncs to my Synology. And then everything that's in this important data area on my Synology NAS goes to Spider Oak. Yeah, and right. that's how I'm doing my back. I'm not, I'm not doing like nightly backups on my laptop, right? I, I, I just don't, I, I don't have time. And to be completely honest, setting up a new installation is kind of like playing a video game for me. So, if, you know, if, if I got to <laughs> right. set aside an evening and stay up super late and have a few yeah. too many drinks to get my KDE configuration rocking, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to take. So then it's just a matter of moving my data back in. And I and you know to to his point, you got to have multiple copies. Uh, and I want to go back to one point in his email. Mint on a server. That's a bad time. I can't. I can't even fathom that. I'm not sure I understand what yeah, the yeah, what I the mean, adva- what the the advantage would be I'm on not the sure desktop. Either. Okay, uh, arguably that's fine. Maybe it's also a desktop. Uh, yeah, that could maybe be it's doing dual duty or something. Because Which otherwise, the, yeah. uh, go Ubuntu LTS if you like the yeah. Ubuntu underlying system. Go Debian, go Cent, whatever. I like Mint, but I, you know the 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 inherent disadvantage that Mint's always going to have, and until they change this, is you need to reinstall to go to the next version. And eventually, if you want to get security updates, you're going to have to reinstall. And this is the problem with reloading servers. Mm-hmm. I, you know, my my approach to a server installation is, I'm really hands off. Right. As much as I can be. Um, and that kind of plays into the whole stability thing. But sorry to hear about that, Richard. I wanted to pass that along to folks out there. You know, just be careful when you're doing that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it and and I you. agree with him, though, on the whole being prompted. I mean, I totally am on board with that, that you should be prompted for something like that. I mean, it's yeah. kind of a... I, I feel like know. the own cloud desktop program is still early days a little bit. And yeah. it just doesn't have the deployment level that Dropbox does. So, it, you know, things like that just don't get quite as identified as much, I guess. Um, so yeah, bummer, Richard. All right. Well, next email comes in from Tim and he's positive in the pragmatic dimension playing okay. off of last week's title. He said, I hear you guys. I believe in support free software. However, there is a lot in my life I have to get done. And a lot of people who depend on me and I will use whatever tools available to get it done. Now, remember last week we were saying, even as Linux, Linux advocates, we can understand how sometimes there's reasons not to use Linux. If an application, you just gotta have, right. You gotta have it. Uh, So he says, I'm beholden to Windows for work, proprietary software, enterprise applications I have to access and use from home. Yet, I have a free NAS box, an Ubuntu server, a Roku, and a DigitalOcean droplet for a VPN, as well as an Android tablet. Not to mention a laptop with whatever distro I'm currently learning about. But again, I have an iPhone from work, and I use Windows for my S-Crypt miners. Uh, It's an economic decision. I could get better hash rates and plain and simple. And I've noticed this too. S-Crypt and uh, also, uh, uh, you know, mining Bitcoin... It is much easier to get up and running under Windows. Um, I don't actually haven't noticed better hash rates under Windows, but it is easier to get running under Windows. He said, I may get bashed for, by free software proponents, but this is the world I live in, and I got to get it done every day. Cheers, Tim. I don't think he's basically looking at this as there's effective behavior and then there's ineffective behavior. And that really removes the argument of, well, you can't do it because that's just not supporting blankety blank. At the end of the day, you have to decide what's going to provide the most effective outcome that you're seeking. And for him, that's what's working. Yeah, so. I think so. I think so. Um, we got an email about uh, about sort of switching over to uh, to Linux. And well, we got a lot of these. And one of them was was quite long. Um, and so I want to I want to read his email to kind of set us up uh, and kind of set the set the tone of the discussion because we've talked before about switching to Linux from primarily Windows. I think maybe now we should start talking about switching from Mac too because I think there's more and more Macs out there. Uh, and I think a lot of times the way we've we've kind of just come out and say yeah it's going to be great it's going to be awesome <laughs> sure it's awesome yeah just just load it up you'll figure it out you yeah know, yeah. yeah so um, 
we have an email that's a great example of what somebody runs into when they take that advice. Okay. So that'll be a good spot, I think, for us to kind of frame this conversation. Plus, plus, or you just did a great piece over on Datamation about Linux's uh, desktop, Linux desktops missed opportunities. So we might even just want to start there. Uh, so before we dig into that, I want to thank our first sponsor this week, and that, my friends, is Ting.com. Now, Ting is mobile that makes sense. My service provider and Matt's service provider for mobile. You can get started by going to linux.ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first month of service or $25 off your first device if you don't already have a device. Now, one of the things that really makes Ting stand out is the pay-for-what-you-use system, and I want to talk about this for a little bit. Actually, I'd say there's a few things that really make Ting stand out. But the pay-for-what-you-use system is pretty unique. I don't really know anybody else that's doing that. Uh, so you, they take your messages, your megabytes, and your minutes, and they add it all up at the end of the month, whatever bucket you fall into. That's all you got to pay. It's pretty reasonable pricing. It's not like it's going to surprise you because they've got a very active dashboard. This is where I want to change gears. Is This dashboard is, is really something. So not only do you get a snapshot of where you're at, what your usage is, what your bills have been, and you can manage all of that. You can activate and deactivate devices. You can manage your voicemail settings. You can manage your call forwarding settings. You can manage manage what happens when you get X amount of calls. You can manage all of this from the most intuitive da da dashboard I have ever seen to do any of this. And as a long-term Ting customer, this is the kind of stuff that down the road, other than the amazing savings you're going to get, because each device is just $6 per month. Yeah, $6 per month for a phone. That's it, you guys. That's all you have to pay. And then you just do you just pay for your usage fairly on top of that. When you combine that with the awesome management of their dashboard, it really, as a long-term solution, really is awesome. And if you go over to ting.com and you're kind of checking things out, you're not quite sure if it's going to work for you, they have a savings calculator. You can get an idea of what kind of money savings you're going to see. And if you're worried about your contract with your current mobile provider, they also have an early termination relief program, up to 75 bones per line. It's super easy. You get your phone from Ting, you port your number to Ting, and then you submit your early termination relief claim to Ting. Now, the other great thing about Ting is they are riding the wave of the investment the Sprint Network is making in LTE right now. Uh, they're trying to roll out LTE. They are on a mad dash right now to roll LTE, LTE out to all major nation, uh, nations, all major areas in the United States. So you're going to see a lot more areas turn up. I happen to be particularly um, lucky, and you might be as well. You can go check out their coverage map on their website. I live in an area where I get great 3G. I get great LTE, and I also get awesome WiMAX. So I'm sort of benefiting from like all the major available types of connectivity, and that for me is, is great because I'm a heavy Waze user, so every moment I spend in the car, I have a data connection that's up, it's pulling down information. The state troopers on, the, on our Interstate 5 here are absolutely maniacs. I went up to the, <laughs> yes. seriously, I went up to the, yeah. uh, to the meat store today uh, up, uh, up, at, uh, up in Arlington, and uh, I uh, four or five cops I uh, on just that, you know, it's between three exits. Waze, flags, all that stuff for me. So Waze is an absolute must. And I don't want to have to sit there and worry about, am I going to reach my two gigabyte cap? Or am I going to, you know, or, or if I, do I need to, do I need to make a slightly less phone calls this month? I, that, all of that, honestly, feels like a scam. It all feels like a scam to get my money when I'm just using the service the way I want to use it. And Ting just nukes all of it. They give you control and they give you the tools to keep control and monitor all of it. Plus, they have fantastic Android apps that really work in concert with all of this stuff. If you're in a small business or if you're in a family, that $6 per line from the pooled minutes and you just pay for what you use really works amazingly well. And then to top it all off, Ting has incredible support. If you can call them and somebody answers. You can go to their support forums. They got people in there discussing stuff. You know, as they're working through the Nexus 5, there's some awesome threads in there right now about getting Nexus 5 working on Ting. And to see that just not not only just to see the community kind of take on that, but to see Ting embrace it, right? Not to try to stamp it down. Oh, no, no. Don't don't try to port some unauthorized device onto our network. Oh, no, they're not about that at all. They embrace the community. They work with them. And by working with their community, they've come up to have a working solution to get the Nexus 5 on Ting. You can go buy the Nexus 5 from the Google Play Store. Like you should be able to just buy a, a computing device directly right, from yeah. the manufacturer. And you can put it on a network where you only, you only pay for what you use and you're in no contract. There's no early termination fee. That's exactly how it should be. We're finally starting to see the smartphone market shape into the version of the future we want, and we can all make that happen. So go over to linux.ting.com. Sign up. You'll get $25 off your first month of service, and I think you're going to be pretty happy. So a huge thanks to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Thank you. That's awesome. All right, Matt. So you wrote a good piece over at Datamation that said Linux's, Linux desktops missed opportunities. And you said if Windows users consider migrating, 
or this was the sub headline, I guess. Yeah. Does the Linux desktop offer a clear and easy choice? And one of the areas you said, well, right now, Linux definitely has a leg up. And some people might be surprised by this, but it has a leg up on old peripherals. This is something that's a misnomer with most people. You ask even experienced Linux people. I've actually had some of them uh, be, actually be misinformed on this. You know, what's the hardware support look between Windows and Linux? With peripherals dating back to even even some modern ones, but especially with older ones. Like scanners um, and printers? Is that what you Scanners about? and printers are the big ones. Um, but even other stuff, Bluetooth dongles, certain headsets, uh, you'd be surprised. In certain, certain, depending on the age, in certain instances, you will find that the support is crap under Windows. Um, even if you try and find a driver, I remember when Windows 7 came out, it had been out for, I don't know, a year at the time, and I was setting my mom up with her printer. Okay, I'll go get a driver for it. HP has no reason to do a driver oh, for that. What this a is nightmare. an old printer. Yeah. yeah. What a nightmare. I mean, now, granted, I managed to hack it together, I think, by yeah. with something later on, and then eventually switched her anyway, but um, to over to Linux. But at the time, it was just like, it was really appalling. Okay, same thing with Bluetooth. Try the Bluetooth dongle. No no love. Okay, maybe there's drivers for it. Nope, Bluetooth dongle's too old. You know what and I more found this is, yeah. it, this is... This is kind of my enterprise background coming mm-hmm. through, but Ethernet adapters, oh, yeah. which oh, yeah, is seriously. such a linchpin because if you don't have <laughs> really network is. connectivity, you can't get drivers for all the other stuff, mm. <laughs> right? And Linux, you know, because the stuff's at the kernel level, man, you just you plug it in, you turn it on, and it's just it just works. Yep. And the experience there, you can if if you really want to personify it, is you take a mouse on a Windows box that's never seen that mouse before, and you plug it in, and then you do that wait while it dunk and it goes out, it downloads oh, the God. updates. It installs the driver, and then the case, well, ironically, the worst offender are the actual Microsoft mouse and keyboard, where then they yeah. download an installer and a wizard you have to run through. And where There's was, some extra software you didn't ask for. Yeah. Right, and same with scanners, right? <laughs> oh but on gosh. Linux, you plug it in, and the software detects it, or it doesn't. It's very one or zero, right, for most basic yep. users. And I think this is a good point, as Linux has sort of got a bad rap from the past because vendors couldn't give a crap about supporting it. But that really has started to change. But the other point you make for switchers is the security issues, right? Windows historically and to this day remains massively targeted by hackers. Oh, it's, uh, it's horrible. Windows yeah. XP, and- obviously worst offender. Um, you know, and you look at the end of Windows XP, seems like a seems like it's an opportunity to make a case here. It's it's absolutely okay. you know, and the big picture here is is that, it, and of course, Windows XP actually ties into my peripheral argument earlier because a lot of people running XP are still running those peripherals that were working with XP. So then you have the peripheral argument, and then on top of that, from the security standpoint, you had a like Swiss cheese operating system that now what little basic security you had is going to be yanked out from underneath you, and there people are going to run it blind. They have no idea. They have no clue. They don't know that what they're running is essentially like. Uh, riding a motorcycle down a bobsled track, you know, and ice and storm. I mean, they have no idea. It's just incredibly dangerous, and they don't know, they realize they're doing it because the marketing yeah. problem. Yeah, know? yeah, you're right. And I, I recommend people go read Matt's piece here. But you also made a, you, and this one I, I kind of want to push on you a little bit here because yeah. you say, well, you know, vendor lock-in is totally not a problem under Linux. But I wonder if that really resonates with Windows users. I don't know if they recognize the fact that they're in vendor lock-in. It's, it's application-specific. Um, most ca- in most instances, it's a, a, maybe some random uh, thing they created. Maybe Let's say a, a, a greeting card maker or some random you know, podunky piece of software. Gosh, they don't or yeah, like the, the, the holiday publisher. card maker. That's such a great yeah. example. That's totally yeah. what I've seen happen yep. too. And yeah. it's the consumer stuff. It's usually some podunk software consumer thing. They bought at Best Buy at one point or whatever it is. And they don't really think twice about it until they go to, I don't know, maybe they're trying to upgrade to the next version of Windows and they realize, okay, it's no longer compatible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or there's, you know, even compatibility modes not working for them or to go to Windows 8 or whatever it may be. Um, and then, of course, going to going to Linux, though, it's not always a straight shot. I mean, there are tools that make it easier. Uh, Scribus, for example, has, great, has yeah. worked on their publisher support, but it's not quite 100% yet. But it's one to watch, and that helps. But that's the danger of vendor lock-in, even at a consumer level. It does exist. It's a problem. So do you, oh. think, do you, think, there's, do you think there is an option here that average – you know, I'm thinking, you know, the people that would want the greeting, make a greeting card software that want to buy that to make a card, they put their kids on it and they send that out to the family as the family holiday card. Do you think there is for a, a, a solution for that type of user under Linux or is that type of user going to be better served by the Mac? 
uh, the, the if I was in PC repair still, first thing I'd do is I'd get up to an affiliate program to want it for one of the cloud based alternatives for that same program, and there's yeah. lots of them. Uh, then when no, then you're not only saying, oh, by hey, by the way, you know your app is no longer compatible with my upgrade. You know they're upgrading them to Windows 8 or whatever it is, but you can go this route. Same thing if you're moving into Linux. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of the conversation we're about to have is like yeah. uh, the cloud. Oh, I hate calling it the cloud. I wish I could. <laughs> should we just call it the butt solutions? I don't know what we should you can call, call it. You can call it the but. butt solutions. I mean, I was in Best Buy here recently, and I remember uh, uh, some woman asking the uh, Geek Squad person, I want to make sure I get the computer with the cloud. Oh, I really no. need cloud. Not the cloud, but just cloud. I want I cloud. cloud. I want cloud. I yeah. got to get some cloud. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, so comes this is the people it, you're dealing with. Well, and look at Microsoft. Well, we've integrated SkyDrive into the Windows operating system. That way you have cloud storage built in. <laughs> because I, they get marketing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as much as I hate to say it, I, I'm yeah. not fan saying that but it's true you know i i look at this and i think um this conversation two even two years ago would be more like yeah if you kind of want that you kind of have to go to the mac but now we're looking at a new generation really of web apps yep that i do a lot I mean, the, like the great example is that greeting card thing could probably mm-hmm. completely be done on on some greeting card makers website you, you they probably have an html5 or god forbid flash based wizard you run through and then they just submit yeah. it and print it right there so the cloud now offers a whole new set of apps because it's itself an application let's just call them web apps we won't call them cloud yep. apps web apps they're web we'll applications them. they run on an nginx or apache server they have a mm-hmm. sql bait back end or something right sure and so this this sort of relieves some of that pressure now as we talk about this it brings me to an email we got uh, and I, I felt I really felt for this guy because uh, the to- the subject was please help me switch from Windows uh, and, and his name is Milan <laughs> and he says hello good people I've been watching you for a bit uh, about less than two years and you're the only nudgers I have helping me switch from the glory whose symbol is inspired by a carpenter's design yes I am struggling to switch to Linux simply because of the non-existing Linux community in my area out of laziness or comfort one seems to want more and better so there uh, so here's my frustrations also my parents have a lot of issues with windows getting them on the mint world would ha- would be would never happen uh, but i've decided to get mint with cinnamon 2 as it seems to be stable i've settled on mint 13 for now cinnamon edition 8 months ago on my old 80 gigabyte hard drive i used matt's guide to do it big thank you matt and it was a breeze the reasons i didn't use it now so here's what happened he ended up reinstalling windows 7 mm-hmm. that process removed the boot choice as an option when he had when he booted up so he could no longer boot into mint obviously windows over overwrote the bootloader oh, yeah. well, now i have are. a drive now i have to dive inside the cable world and unplug my main hard drive to power up mint and that annoys me so i'm going to have linux on its own machine all by itself and be windows free second problem i have no power programs i like to use on mint things like photoshop premiere there's also a lack of audio players such as awesome or amp, and yes, one can run into one can run some of these things under wine, but I do not see that as a viable option. Everyone praises Clementine. I haven't tried it, but it seems fine. It just seems a little bloated. I have a noted. I have I noticed a couple episodes ago that you set up a service for monitoring resources. Mm-hmm. He says I can do. I can also set those. I've noticed. I you know went and found a parallel. I can set that up. Uh, but uh, he says I don't like the way it works. You know, there's some things that lack compared to the commercial versions. He says some of these things seem like silly stuff. But you had a little quarrel a couple episodes ago in the IRC on the same topic, and he says, I share your same point of view. Windows is just too comfortable. Everything works for me in Windows. I spent a lot of resources to get under people's skin. It's made uh, it's made us weak and comfortable seeking fools, thinking that data security is an issue that is non-existent and unimportant. He says, I'm also a bit fed up with Google, mainly about mail safety, but also forcing the way it uses some of their products onto us. So he says, here's the essentials I need in order for Linux to get some traction. In a nutshell, I need Photoshop, Premiere, a good audio player, and system resource monitoring, and a mail service. So the long and short of this is right off the bat. The, fir- the first mistake he's making is this is someone who obviously, you know, using computers in his professional life. And so a one-size-fits-all tool is probably a bit naive. Um, he probably does need to consider a multi-platform experience because, you know, that sounds like he's got a lot of stuff. Music player thing, I definitely argue with that. I think there's minimalist music players. You just got to spend oh, yeah. a little time yeah, at yeah, SourceForge yeah, yeah. or whatnot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as the other part of it, you know, I today ha- actually had to u- do a multi-Skype thing uh, for work. And I plugged in my headset with Skype opened, and boy, you betcha, it went ahead and just froze the entire desktop <laughs> for me because that's a feature. So I reboot oh. with the, with the d- device detected. 
it sees the device, but I can't get any sound to happen. So, uh. I go, so you know, this not, this belief that you know one operating system is somehow easier to use. Honestly, I think it it proves to me it's it's really what you spend the most time in. So because I yeah. spend so much time in Linux, I pull my hair out trying to do the most basic stuff in Windows. I can't. I, yeah. I, I spend all my time in the device manager going, okay, no, what's broken? You know, just like, give me yeah, a break. I think you're right too. Uh, like, so the other thing, another email we got this week was uh, somebody who tried to switch to Linux and yep. uh, just was not happy with any CAD solutions, right? And so, and that's a fair point, actually. Yeah. I guess too. Part of me feels like you got to do a little research before you make the switch. Well, you, should, you would think, yeah. No, I. There are a number of program areas. Is that where, asking too much? Um, the research, no, but at the same time, the expectation has been set. See, Microsoft and, and even to a certain extent, Apple has made people complacent in right. You're whatever right. you do. Don't think. Yeah, we're going to do our, especially Apple. We're going to do our thinking. We're going to do the thinking for you. Well, I mean, look at the case. To, uh, and, you know, but look at Windows, right? Windows is so popular that you're guaranteed yep. to probably find an application that'll do what you yep. expect. Just based on market share, it's a given. The market has spoken in that space. Could be a shit app. They, I mean, it could be completely crap. Yeah, yeah. it could be off some shareware site. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's interesting. I think with Linux, it's that's again going back to what I was saying as far as, you know, Joe Bob's distro. When they're promoting these distributions, they need a section that is painfully clear. Your experience is going to be completely different than anything you've had before. This is not a Windows experience. Yeah, and and it, I think you know. you're kind of getting Honestly, to- I think when it comes to that, Ubuntu does yeah. a great job. It says right up front, this is eh. not Windows. Do not expect it to be Windows. I've yet to find that page. <laughs> I'm not huh. maybe it, in, it's in the yeah. download page. Is it okay? So you're thinking maybe an update. I've not I've not experienced that because everybody I've ever talked to that frustrates with it's like, well, I don't understand why it's you know, and I think also that you're also even if it's a paragraph or even a whole page, you're expecting people to unlearn a lot of that too, um, to I, where I'm again Windows made people lazy and here, but, you know, complacent. Um, so I, I think it's not that uh, Ubuntu is trying to say it's we're not Windows; they're trying to say it, we're OS ten. That was a slam. But yeah, no, I think Ubuntu does a good job, but I mean, you know, their documentation is a great example. Horribly, horribly out of date. Um, I can point to example after example of just, I, and it, again, it's all volunteers, and I get that. I understand that. But compared to, say, like Arch right. or some of these other distros, it's like, obviously, it's not, you know, in, they're, it's not impossible. Well, Don uh, Thornton Jr. in the chat room says, why switch? Why does it have to be all or nothing? Right. That's what I was saying. You know, every, you know, there's different tools for different jobs. That's why I live in a multi-platform universe. Yeah. I mean, even uh, here, like you know. I've got, I've got, I got a couple yeah. of Macs. I got, right. I don't have any windows anymore, but I did for right. a long time, yeah. you know, because I mean, and, and I've got to be honest on my end, my desktop, my main entertainment machine runs windows, <gasps> but my laptop wow. is a hundred percent Linux. Is my that that Netflix? That's, that's how I started out actually back in the day. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. My suggestion is to uh, just like use something like Mint that has already a good base of applications installed, and just use right. the IRC. Don't be afraid to ask questions in the IRC right. because, I mean, the problem with the Ubuntu IRC is there is a ton of people in there, and oftentimes they'll just get flooded like after like two or three seconds. Yeah. And a Mint IRC is a little bit more stable in that regard too, and plus. They'll help you most of the time in there too. See, but people don't people don't know about IRC, right? I mean, see, here's we are gonna what we are gonna be encountering is the Steam generation, right? The Call of Duty players, or whatever it's gonna be, who, uh, you know, for, I don't want to. I'm trying not to be stereotypical here, but can I just can I, let's just go worst case scenario. Sure. Mom and dad won't pay for a new version of Windows. I need I need Steam OS, so I load it on a box. I have no idea what mm-hmm. I'm getting into, or I try yep. out Ubuntu. I have no idea what I'm getting into, but I know it can play Steam games. I know it can browse the web. So I'm just going to jump whole hog into it, because here's what I'm noticing, you guys, and this is not, I'm not, I don't mean to, like, shame anybody who's emailed in, because, you know, right. because you emailed in, we have this topic, but um, a lot of... A lot of people don't even don't even look beyond their nose. They just jump, man. They just they just they have a certain expectation of sort of appliance like functionality because their previous operating system provided them appliance like functionality in a sense, and they just switch like whole hog. Like I got to open up an AutoCAD file tomorrow. I'm going to switch to Linux today, and they just do it. <laughs> and I and I I feel like I want to I want to I want to put up a red flag here and say if you're listening to our content. And and you think that's possible? It is not. It is you know you are switching, you are switching to a different philosophy of computing, and one that I argue is better. It is worth that switch. It is worth that effort. But it is a transition, my friends. It is. It'd be a well, good I, chunk of time to get rid of my Windows partition. 
But yeah. I still have Windows programs I have to run, so right. I run them in a virtual machine. Yeah, so, and yeah. Another thought, you know, is this uh, next couple days, I'm actually pl- going to play with OpenSUSE 13.1 and try to get Pipelet working on that. And I might try to spend some full-time Linux experience on my desktop again for the first time in a while to see how that runs. That should be fun. Chris, I think, you're, I think you're talking about awareness here, really. There's not enough awareness of what Linux yeah. is all about. And that's why some people, they, they fire up. Um, we always pick on Ubuntu because it's the easiest one to install um, or mint a variation, although Debian soon. Um, so they, they fire it up and they think it's going to work out of the box. It does, more or less until you start installing proprietary drivers and there's a kernel update for example and things like that yeah 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 that can be really tricky you know we were just talking on the pre-show on the live stream about uh about the need to sometimes update your kernel to get some piece of hardware working correctly well not only that but with new computers as well um there's a new hurdle that you know with traditional bios really wasn't that big of a deal uefi yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, that new hurdle there is really, yeah. uh, for us, it's like, okay, whatever, you just find stuff in a different place. Or, no, you, you, know, you nailed it. People have been emailing yeah. in and they've been talking Every about it. Every one of them is different. Yeah, yeah. they've been talking yeah, about it. It's a know, problem. If I can bring something up about the codecs, on, on Windows and OS ten, people expect those codecs to be there out of the box these yeah. days. The idea of having to install codecs yeah. is... It seems like a deficiency. It seems like a deficiency in the functionality of my desktop operating system to them. Oh, and I think that's why a lot of them are going mint. School. The old school mindset is when someone buys a computer, it's an appliance like a toaster. Yeah. And that is what mm-hmm. they've been growing up they've in. Been when they it. actually switch the internals of the toaster, a, our system is dynamic. It's organic. Well, yeah. No, it's it's static, like my aunt. It? Yeah, it's not that's static it. like they bought when they bought the my biggest, my biggest suggestion is, is like, you have to search about these things. You, Google is your best friend in well, these situations. Like, what if we just said? What if we just said, Linux is computing without the training wheels, and it's it's for not. It's just not for the absolute beginner user. It is right. Linux is for somebody who is comfortable with googling things. Linux is for somebody who's comfortable with. You know, having to maybe set a few settings that they wouldn't normally mm-hmm. have to set under these other. Is that really that bad to say? I, think I wouldn't yes even agree with that, though. I think yes. As long know. as they're not too old of a dog to learn a new trick. Well, I they disagree can use too. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't agree with that. Just because, for example, my mom is a is a person who doesn't want to learn how to do anything like that, and yeah. I have a neighbor who has no intention of ever learning how to install anything. They don't even know how to what an EXE file is on Windows. Mm-hmm. So. I what I would suggest is if there's people like that that you want to have try Linux, don't just tell them to try Linux. Uh, give them an out of the box situation where you take their computer, put everything up, set it exactly how they they're going to use their computer, and then let them go at it, and they will never have a problem. Exactly. That's, that's, that's what I do with my wife. That. My wife yeah. is running Linux on her computer. It's an Arch install that I made for her because I know what she's going to use it for. I know that she's not going to tinker around with it and muck it up at all. She's not even going to touch the command line. She's just going to do word processing and web browsing for school. That's all she's going to do. So why yes. Arch? Why Arch? Because I can custom make it for <laughs> her. Because, because you have yeah, to, you're managing it. Yeah. But you have to manage yeah. it. You have to manage it for her. But there's a difference, though, too, because like you know that you can just update it and never have to worry about reinstalling. If True. you're only doing those yeah. things, if you're not trying to add like five different desktops to it and stuff like that. And that was the major motivating factor, to be honest. Exactly. For many people, yeah. their operating system is like a religion. You're not going to be able to change their way of thought. There's some cases which cannot be fixed. They cannot change. They're stuck. Well, those That's are true because you're trying to not... retrain the brain. You're trying to retrain how people think. And you know, and I go back to what I said about the Ubuntu page. I'm, I've looked back and forth both on uh, slash download and slash download slash desktop. It, it's as, you couldn't be, you know, it says nothing. Yeah, you uh, almost wonder, you almost nothing. think like there should be a legal disclaimer warning your Windows applications yeah. will not work under Ubuntu. Honestly, it has a um, lot of great, it has a lot of great details here, but it's yeah. missing, it's missing that core. Hey, by the way, we have a great operating system experience for you, but understand it's different. Yeah. Honestly, that, that's I think not here. this is why this whole discussion is why canonical is partnering up with these manufacturers to push right. out computers in markets where people don't have that established bias. Yeah, it does seem and like it's like in Africa. Firefox OS. Yeah. I actually have a that's great good. wallpaper for that, too. It's uh, 
it's a little hitchhiker's guide, a little like robot thing. It says, "Don't yeah. panic, it's not Windows." <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Exactly. I like it. You gotta send that. Like, put it in the room or something. Oh, what, yeah. I think that um, I, th- I think this Microsoft has built this regime where um, we all fl- we have all learned to ride the bike, and we all know to ride the bike. We pedal forwards and we start moving forwards. Um, and for somebody to say, "Hold on, you can start pedaling with your arms," they're like, "No, that's not what Microsoft has ta- taught us to do." Do you, do you see what I mean? Not at I- all. <laughs> Well, no, I, 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 I think it goes. Comparison. Oh, it makes, it makes sense because I think it goes deeper than Microsoft. I think it goes deeper into how, you know how many people will actually truly cook a meal versus do whatever is quick and easy. How many people truly change their own oil versus go to the quickie lube? Yeah, how right. many people are truly go and milk their own uh, cow? You know, I mean, so Microsoft catered to an audience of people that wanted that anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Windows the Windows environment is. Yeah. is just as much of a sandbox as the Mac is. It's just a way bigger sandbox. And to me... It's becoming more closed and closed as it keeps going. Oh, yeah. yeah the That's advantages cool. <laughs> of the Windows desktop are diminishing. And the yeah. advantages of the Linux desktop are increasing, especially mm-hmm. as we get to HTML5-based applications, especially as Qt comes around and we get a lot more cross-platform applications. As all of these things mature, the, the advantages that Linux... Linux inherently advantages from cross-platform development from web standards, from all of this stuff, and Windows right. inherently di- is disadvantaged by those things because they take away the Windows advantage, right? They take away the monopoly. So it's almost like this problem we are struggling with today, we are heading, I I, I truly believe we are heading, and I, don't, I, I couldn't put a time date, I couldn't put a time and date on it. We are heading to a point where just like Linux has completely dominated every area of computing. The desktop eventually, like like Steve Ballmer said, almost like a cancer, will be consumed by Linux because as these top-tier vendors begin to focus on their new areas of revenue, mobile, they will they will recede and they will they will they will lesser often less they will offer less and less advantages to running on those platforms. And as Linux will continue to just grow as it has it will benefit from standardization. It will benefit from all of these things that weaken these other guys, and it will become the dominant desktop platform. I don't know what that's going to look like or what form factor is going to take place in, but I got to believe these problems we are talking about right now, these are solvable problems. And I do not believe these Windows, the problems that Windows faces are solvable. I, I believe they are the eventual outcome of a maturing market. Well, like Windows squeezing is also water killing Eventually Windows it's gonna intentionally. Pop. I think that uh, and people when ch- when changing from Windows because it is a, they they don't like it or whatever the reason they have to know that in Linux you don't use the same program as in Windows because you don't have them and you use you you use alternatives like yeah. LibreOffice. Yeah. You don't use WinAmp. You use Rittenbox or. Clementine, you use different programs, and you you need to know that before you switch. I guess uh, I feel like we've always we've always hung our hat on games are the barrier to desktop Linux. And man, if we just had games, dude, if we just had games, people would be switching to Linux. And now right. I feel like we're starting to get um, games, and I'm realizing I, I actually stop. it's more than that. Um, you know, and another y'all thing y'all I kind of want to mention is. Yeah. The whole thing about the word Linux sometimes being dirty in people's mind. You ever wonder, mm-hmm. like back in 2010 when Canonical changed their branding of Ubuntu, they started removing a lot of references to the I word think, Linux. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of understandable. Like, you know, cars aren't manufactured as gasoline anymore, right? This is a gasoline engine. Like, everybody just kind of assumes it's a gasoline Delicious. engine. Y'all, people uh, yeah. To it. Linus has said this before. People do not install OSs. They just don't. Right. Yeah, that's right. right. So, like, your average Joe is not going to download a, you, like an ISO of a Bluetooth yep. and put it on a flash drive and install it. That's just not going to happen. It's got to be somebody like us to show them that. Or, 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 or it's mine. mobile. A I think that mine. most people don't even know what is Linux. When my mom came to, to my room and said, what's it Ubuntu thing? What's yeah. that? Yeah, I think the right. Linux branding right now, so here's what it is. It's a deficient brand. It is. It, there isn't enough there to, 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 to bank on it. Brands are like a commodity that could literally be traded on a stock market, and they are they are so much amazing amount of value. You guys don't even realize how manipulated you are by brands, but brands are everything. 
And what Linux mean, right now see? doesn't have a super strong brand. Windows actually has the opposite problem. It had a great brand. It had a very strong brand. Shit, you bought something because it supported Windows or because Windows ran on that, and that's why you bought it. But now... It is a debt. It is a problem. Things are in the marketplace do not succeed when they are branded with Windows. So they have crossed that lexicon, right? They have right. moved into territory where Windows now is a, is is a problem. Linux is the the branding of Linux is not yet like oh shit that's Linux oh I'm gonna buy that but it could I, I, get there. I think it suffers from a lot of old stereotypes where it was the quote hackers OS where you required yeah, yeah. more knowledge to use it. But you could have made that same argument and if you take it. So one of the things that I think you can draw parallels to, to watch what happens in a, in a, in a compressed time frame, the commercial industry, in my opinion, operates in a much more compressed time frame than the open source, organic, evolved market, which is the Linux yep. market. If you look at the Apple branding, right? Apple uh, was a joke in the late 90s. I don't know how many how old you guys are, but in the oh, late yeah, 90s, they were, they, they were terrible. Was awful, right? Yeah. <laughs> Now, now they're now they're almost like at like uh, like at a at a at a, you know, the, the, their brand is like the number one brand in the world or some crap like that. they're like they're competing with Coke. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> and so you can see how you as long as I I feel like the brand can cross from I feel like you can have a brand that people understand isn't there yet, and then down the road they'll acknowledge okay it's reached that point where it's refined enough that now it's good it's a good thing and I know about this and it's good whereas a brand like Windows can also be can can travel that whole lifespan and then enter that period that it's in now I, I don't feel like Linux has crossed that too. what's that but, but, I wonder you testimony. know how close are we going to achieve that when distributions like Ubuntu would rather focus on the Ubuntu brand rather than saying oh hey we're Linux. But aren't Linux you glad? will never be that brand. It will never be that brand because it's Im it's impossible for the because the people who own the brand of Linux and own the, yeah. the trademark yeah. won't do that themselves, and a company won't want to put money behind it to advertise someone else. It doesn't make but sense. But it is it is more empowering to the user, and in this case, the user could be the manufacturer that they don't have to live on that brand, that they can build their own. The fact that Ubuntu True. can build a respected brand by using Linux makes Linux more important. Like, I go back to my gasoline comparison. Like, GM doesn't say this is the gasoline-powered Chevy Volt or whatever. Volt's probably a bad example. Chevy truck or whatever, right? <laughs> they, don't, they don't advertise the fact that it's powered by gasoline. I mean, everybody just knows it. Well, yeah, I think another and I guess an electric would car would have different uh, advertising and branding. Although, I mean, the same thing goes for like Chrome OS or Android. You don't; it's more about the Android focus or the Chrome OS focus, and not so much on the Linux aspect, which I definitely understand. Well, I kind of like let them do it, like the Chevy Lithium. Chevy Lithium's one. I, a, a big piece of what we got to remember is r what makes or breaks a brand is the experience that they are selling and or otherwise offering. If they're selling an experience that you want to participate in or emulate in some fashion, whether it be Apple or whatever it may be, it's like, wow, I like what they're doing. I want to do that or I want to try that or I want to experience that. That's what will make a brand successful. Yeah. Even if it's oh, passive, even if you're watching when something. When it comes to the business side yeah. of things or the quick yeah. and or the, yeah, you know, it's and, always the business apps. That yeah. And I think that that's why Ubuntu focused on changing. Games. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I think that's why Ubuntu focused on changing their branding three, four yeah. years ago. Yeah, it is. Because rather than being Linux for human beings, yeah. they were just Ubuntu. Yeah, it is. That is a good point. And I, so I guess the way to kind of bring this back to the switching conversation is people, people will be, people definitely, I mean, based on my inbox. So here's the trend I've noticed. When I started doing the Linux Action Show, it was Fedora that people were finding because they were finding the link from Red Hat and then they would follow that down to Fedora and then they would try out Fedora and then they'd be burned. And you'd see it, you'd see that reflected in my reviews. Like I'd be like, why the F are they doing this? Don't right. they understand they're making, I mean, literally, you go back to my early Fedora reviews and I'd be like, don't they understand they're making the Linux community look bad by shipping a volume applet that doesn't actually change the volume? Like I, but now, now I would say, the vast majority, the vast majority of emails are people that are trying Mint or Ubuntu. Yeah. Mint or Ubuntu. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting, it seems to be older versions of Mint, too. I don't Where's that coming from? Magazines? I don't that's know what weird. that's about. Magazines I, I found it, Ubuntu yeah. back in 2006. That was my first experience with Linux. And now when I use Linux, I go right for OpenSUSE just because of the, of the tools it offers. I think this is part of the problem is like, to understand what makes a successful long-term viable desktop, and, and it's based on like, well, what do you need? 
For me, I want community and I want modern software. So that's Arch, right? But for a lot of folks, it's I want to know this is going to be around forever. I want to I want to know it's enticing to commercial software creators. And and in that definition, uh, Fedora, Ubuntu, and OpenSUSE fit that definition a lot better. But how is a Windows user supposed to know that? Exactly. And if you go back to early days of Linspire, Xandros, and some of the other guys, we've seen people try and take this uh, concept without any disclaimer, disclosure, or what their people are getting into, put it into storefronts, or in some cases, online shopping. People will buy these machines not realizing what they're actually getting. So they get it home and they say, great, I'm going to go ahead and install my, let's say, you know, the greeting card maker software. They put the CD in the tray, they close the tray, nothing they happens. go to install it, nothing happens. Okay, what's going on? Well, okay, I'm going to, I got to get Microsoft Office on here. I got Microsoft this. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Got my, I got my product key. I had to, you know, dig it out from yeah. under in the drawer. Got it, good to go. <laughs> entered it in, nothing. And so it's like, okay, well, especially with Xandros, which actually, believe it or not, for a while required a product key, which was weird. Yeah, but, you know, that's which right. Which really sent, sent the mixed message. But these guys, you know, this was the early days. And what was worse is if you look back at the time, they were, I won't use the brand names, but they were using very low end hardware. So you had a double pronged sword of misinformation, yeah. really bad experience, a, 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 mi- well, a misunderstanding on OS and, and then bad hardware. To make it more confusing, at least under Xandros, <clears throat> business oh, edition, business oh, edition. God. Came bundled with crossover, which yep, I like. That's right. I like yeah, a crossover was fine, but, but they didn't really explain. What no, you're and doing. you'd put the you'd put uh, if you put the Office CD in your CD drive, yep. like it would auto mount it, and it would actually start the Office installation mm-hmm. process, that's right. <laughs> like right there. And it's, it's very confusing because like some applications. So what you got was some applications automatically install when I put in the disk, and some don't do anything. I don't understand what's going right. on, right? <laughs> And then you had Linspire, which on the consumer side of it, uh, automatically worked with DVDs, uh, encrypted or otherwise. It, yeah, uh, it yeah. actually even went so far as to allow you to purchase weird stuff like, hang on to your hats, kids, parental controls. Dun, dun, we dun. don't have that now, Ooh. but we had that back then. And they did a really good job with it, actually. And then, of course, you had a variety of other tools. But even with all that stuff, because of the legacy concerns and questions and things that people would have and no real support system, they didn't really understand what they were getting into. So I would say... I guess our tips to new switchers to kind of put a bow on this whole thing yeah. is just spend some weekends, spend some some late nights doing your research, find yes. find all of the programs you think you would use for the stuff you need before you switch. So you That's know right. going in what programs you're going to try, right? I would also suggest dual booting. Oh, yeah, or, or virtualization. I, I, and see, Live I, I would, USB. I, yeah, I, I would say USB is one. Dual booting at one time risky. I was a bit, yeah, dual booting. I was a big proponent of it one time. I used to think it was great. Um, these days, I, I absolutely shaking my head, yeah. jumping up and down. No. <laughs> yeah, with the uh, with the UEFI, it seems to yeah. be kind of hit and miss. One of the things I've been yeah. noticing in the emails is UEFI. Sometimes people booting up their machines and they're just getting different results, even. So yeah. and uh, who's to say a Microsoft update won't break something? You know, MBR wise, you don't know. I mean, uh, you're just thing putting your lot of trust mean? in that. Is when I dual boot, you know, I find one week I'll spend ninety percent of my time in one OS and then boot right. to the other and feel alien. So I go spend a week yeah. in that and yeah. then vice versa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. it's absolutely too. a depressing conversation because a lot of times either you're if you're willing to learn and try something new, Linux is a good option. If you're not willing to learn and try That's something great. new, you have to stay with Windows. It's I think you nailed it. Yeah, and sad. Yeah. Well, I mean, Windows yeah. is gonna Windows Seven, which is the last good version of Windows. Uh, yeah. Here, here, you, <laughs> here, ye. This is the last version of Windows that will ever be acceptable, as far as I'm concerned. It really wasn't well, terrible to me. Windows no. is actually going to die. Yeah, when yeah. Microsoft I mean, themselves are going to kill Windows. So you have time, though. I mean, it's not gonna. They're not gonna pull the plug on it next year. It's got years of support left. So there, it's not like somebody can't find the time to try this stuff out eventually. Buy a new machine. Set up your new machine. So then see how it works. And if it doesn't work with Linux, then put Windows on it. You know, there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Virtualization, dual boot, whatever works for you. Yeah, usually whatever they buy, they're going to use. They don't care to change it. It comes as it is. I feel like Mm -hmm. if you're going to take this on yourself, wait till you're going to buy a new computer. And when you buy Uh, that new computer, put Linux on it. And just try it like that for a little bit because then you have your old computer if something should go wrong. Here's what I don't like about the dual boot. The dual boot... The problem with that is you immediately will reboot your computer after 30 seconds of not being able to do whatever it is you know you could do within 10 seconds on the other operating system. So the problem is that temptation to hit that restart button 
And now you've got an SSD, so it's going to reboot into Windows super fast, so it's not like you got to wait that long. You're going to reboot back into Windows, and you're just going to get the job done under Windows. And the problem is, lesson will never be learned. You'll never have learned how to do that. If you have it on its own machine, it's just that much more of a barrier where you're going to stick with it and try it for a little bit, and you know you've got plan B. You can go over to the other computer if you can't get it working on that new computer. And I'm envisioning, like, you got a desktop for years, and you buy a new laptop. Maybe right, you try that new right. laptop with Linux and you keep Windows on that desktop for a month or two until you've decided you can switch over, right? I mean, and other things like Dropbox and BitTorrent Sync, by the way, make this a lot easier. Set up a synchronization between your two machines, open the same files on both machines, and if you're working on a GIMP file and you just can't get it to work the way you want, after you've tried it enough, go open it up on Photoshop, right? And do it there, but you can avoid the dual boot. There's solutions where you can avoid the dual boot now. Uh, with there UEFI, are. I think it might be start... It might be time to start considering, at least for a little while, not doing the dual boot solution. And that, Chris, is kind of why I have a different machine for different purposes and run a different yeah. OS on different machines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think you really nailed it there because I think at the end of the day, I generally recommend to people that if you have an older computer and you're wanting to try Linux and you're going to buy a new computer anyway, whatever your new computer is, I generally recommend using the operating system it comes with. If you know, you know, if you're not sure... Get it with whatever you're going to do, you know, whatever you're at. But with older computers, you have a little more flexibility in that you know the compatibility is going to be more likely, especially with people that tend to buy a brand new Windows machine. And then they go, oh, I'm going to go put Ubuntu on it. And then, you know, five, five minutes later, they're in the forums whining about how Ubuntu sucks because it doesn't work with this thing that has a Microsoft sticker on it, I might add. You know, so yeah, yeah. that's my, big, <laughs> that's no, one that's, my biggest that's price. That's good. Well, well said. And, 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 and mm. also maybe a little bit is be willing to be your own teacher. Like Bullet Freak right. is saying in the chat room is like, yep, yep. you know, the uh, – we are living in a time where information is so abundantly available to us. It's kind of ridiculous. Yes. Like to not take advantage of that exactly. is, is almost negligence on our part. So be willing to be your own teacher. Do the investigation that you need to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's. Remember trying to learn stuff pre-internet? I was having this conversation with my nephew earlier. You know what we used to do? They are. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, when I, you know, in the enterprise, what we would do is about once every quarter, we would a couple of guys, a couple of guys would jump in the car and we could take a super long lunch. And we go down to the most, the closest Barnes and Noble, and we would just buy a crap ton of books. <laughs> we would just buy a bunch of books, right? Because we didn't have Google. Right. We didn't exactly. have Google, man. I mean, come on. I mean, maybe we had Alta Vista back then, maybe, but that sucked. Yeah. Well, that was a joke. Yeah. yeah. So we bought books. Now, now you just Google. I mean, clear, everybody knows Hotbot <laughs> One, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, good times. I kind of miss some of that a little bit. I miss Hotbot. I don't know why. Maybe it's the logo. I don't yeah, know what it was, yeah, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I want to shift gears and kind of uh, bring us into the end of this week's show. But first, I had an email I wanted to get to, uh, and that was from No Need to Pronounce My Name Correctly. Hey, that's one I think I can get. I think I can manage that one. <laughs> they just won the internet. What do you think? You think I can? You think I, I could? I think you nailed it. Uh, but before we do, I want to talk about uh, our sponsor this week. Now, Matt, did you know that DigitalOcean is sponsoring this week's episode of Linux Unplugged? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, DigitalOcean is cloud hosting made simple. Now, Cloud hosting, mm, like somebody, like Ray, Ray, me and our audience pointed out, cloud hosting might not be the best way to put it. Think of it as hosting you completely control on your own. It is a brand new way of getting your own server under 55 seconds. And pricing starts at just $5 per month. DigitalOcean has data centers in New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. The interface is super simple. It's in two, with a uh, the control panel. They call it intuitive. I would say the control panel is inspired. It is so easy yeah. to deploy a new machine, whether you want a LAMP stack, you want something that supports Docker, or you want to go cray-cray like I did and deploy <laughs> a Linux machine, you can. It's all click-click and you've got it. 55 seconds, shh, if you're slow. Here's what you can get in under 55 seconds for only $5 per month. 512 megabytes of RAM, 20 gigabytes of SSD storage, one CPU, and wow. a terabyte of transfer. Now, you might think, oh, SSD, that's interesting. You know what? It is interesting. And when you combine it with their super fast network speeds, oh boy, does that sucker sing, let me tell you. So here's what I want you to do. Go over to digitalocean.com and use the promo code LINUX13. That's going to get you a $10 credit. Now, if you buy their lower end machine for 5 bucks, their beginning machine, that's the machine I've been using it now. $5 a month when you combine SSD storage with their crazy with their crazy awesome network performance and the fact that Linux has amazing memory management with so 512 megs of RAM is plenty for what I'm using it for. I have been so happy and I got the first 2 months for free because I used the code Linux13. They'll give you a $10 credit. The $5 machine means you get it for 2 months. They've also got servers by the hour. If you want to toss up a machine, now here's what's great, is they have droplets. And these can be the pre-configured uh, droplets like I was talking about, uh, LAMP, 
uh, Docker, or you can make your own image like I've done of my Arch installation. And then if I want to test something and I don't want to spend a couple of hours setting up Arch, mm-hmm. I just deploy that image. I do an update and then I've got a fully current Arch machine with all the installations I need and I can pay by the hour if I like. I think it's really nice too because you can also resize on demand. So if I want to really throw something at it, I can add more memory, more CPU. I can get web console access if I don't want to fire up SSH. You can also SSH into it later. You get backups, you get snapshots, you get one-click application installs. It is really awesome. Plus, they have a 99.99% uptime SLA. So go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code Linux13. Oh, by the way, DigitalOcean offers a vast collection of tutorials for their community. Yeah, they're big on community. You know I'm a fan of that, too. Here's the great part, though. If you want to contribute to the articles that community has, you know, reference stuff, if they decide something they want to publish to the community, you can get $50 per published piece. That is that is awesome. That's awesome. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, too, as well as a link to get this deal. Use the promo code Linux13 when you're checking out over at DigitalOcean. You're going to love it. I've been using it for all kinds of things. It's a fixed cost, so I know what it's going to be every single month, not like some of the other stuff where it, it varies depending on CPU and bandwidth, and you had a surprise. It's got a great, amazing, awesome interface. I get root access to my box, and the performance is incredible. And on the back end, I love the technology they're using. They're using Linux. They're using KVM. They're using industry standard security technologies, and I love it. So go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code LINUX13 to get a $10 credit on your account. And thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. You know what's awesome about that? Huh. For You know, you got the promo. You walk in, right? You get started essentially for free, really. And then by the time you're done and you want to continue with it, it's like a Starbucks coffee. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, it's no bigs, right? Right. Yeah, it's great. I love it. All right, no need to pronounce my name, sis. First off, thanks for last and all the shows on Jupiter Broadcasting. I've been an avid listener ever since installing Ubuntu 9.10 and experienced I'm an, uh, and experienced Linux for the first time back then. And oh man, oh man, did I freaking fall in love. Now, after all these long years, I have been mainly staying in Ubuntu. In particular, 12.04 LTS has been treating me well. I'm not much worried about having the bleeding edge like an arch, but with all these news and all of these recent privacy issues in Ubuntu, I have thought about switching to a different distro. I know, Chris, you use Linux Mint. Actually, I use Arch these days, but I like it. <laughs> and yeah. I do like Cinnamon quite a bit. It caught uh, his eye as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He said, I've used Unity uh, starting with tw- in 12.04, and you know, I'm looking at the next LTS release, and I really feel like maybe after looking at what their plans are for the next LTS, maybe I should try Linux Mint. But at the same time, I kind of want to know how Manjaro works. It's rolling release instead of LTS, so I kind of want to test it out. I know Matt likes Manjaro. I do. So here's here's the long and short of it. I would say, is it as easy as Ubuntu? Not exactly. It's close. But there's a couple of sn- uh, little snags that you might run into along the way. The good news is, is that their forums probably have already covered it. So if you're willing to check uh, that out, you're probably fine. Yeah. Like setting – just little things. Um, the, on the bonus side of it, yeah, most of the stuff you expect to be set up like an Ubuntu will be set up for you automatically and you want to fool with it. That is nice. Uh, if you're wanting to actually step out a little further and try something a little more uh, hands-on, um, you can actually go full-on Arch with uh, you know what we're using now, Integros. Integros. Yeah, Integros, Integros has kind of been uh, yeah. a hit in the, in the uh, JB community. It's it has. Yeah. Totally based on straight-up Arch. So, it doesn't, so one of the big things I'm not totally sold on with Manjaro is is their approach to stability is having a repo that they just kind of held back for a little bit. But I do not believe, and I could be wrong, and maybe time will fix this, but I do not believe their testing base, it, it, it's not big enough to really suss out problems. So what you really just get is delayed packages. Now, that's a bit yeah. of a... That's yeah. a I am sure Manjaro Camp hates hearing that criticism, but the reality is, is that's that's how I see it. They're not Debian, right? They don't have a Debian deployed base right. where they literally have thousands and thousands of people running the testing branch. That they, is true. Yeah, they probably no, have true. hundreds of people using the testing branch, maybe 500. Who knows, right? Whereas with Integros, you stayed more married to the mainline Arch. So when Arch pushes out that security fix, you get it right away. But I would also point out that, and that's true, and, and you know, I definitely would agree with that, but I would also say the difference between setup is, oh, there's no question Manjaro's easier. I mean, it's, oh, it's really? not, it's, oh, yeah, it's not, it's not hard for Integros just because, I mean, I've so done Arch. Is, so for me doing Arch, it was no big deal. See, I mean, Integros for, has a very Ubuntu-like installation. It's, re- oh, no, the install, the install's fine, but as uh. far as, like, getting some of the niceties set up, first of all, if you don't know what Pac-Man is from Space Invaders, and yeah. you're coming into this, yeah. okay, then what are you doing? Yeah. Um, the, you know, the tool they provide, the little... You know, you might want to actually. You'll either want to study up ahead of time and learn what the hell it is. So, or if you go with you go with Manjaro, they provide an app to where you don't really care. Do you think maybe? <laughs> do just, you think you maybe know. he should go Mint? 
Uh, you know, because he's kind of coming from a, you know, an Ubuntu Debian kind of space and he's kind of doing the whole apt scene. Um, you or know, elementary is, OS. Yeah, I'd say probably elementary OS over Mint. Mint is making me kind of nervous lately. So elementary OS is probably a good choice. Manjaro is cool if you want to try something cool or new. Um, and, and Tegros is awesome as well. Uh, but if you want something you can just slide in directly, probably elementary. Mint, o- Mint I don't know. I just – lately they're just not, – not because of the, all the other stuff that's been going on as far as the back and forth, but more no. just from stability. I'm not really feeling it. I've always had – I've always had nothing but problems getting it to work right. Oh, snaps. Um, You're talking about so, cinnamon? Yeah. Or no, not just cinnamon, but just the later versions of Mint. It's like there's always some little thing that pops up that, yeah, I can work with it, but it's just kind of like, look, I, if I want to work with it, I'll use a more advanced operating system. You know, he he just, also asked, you know, like, how would you compare rolling releases to LTS? And I would say apples and oranges, right? So the yeah. LTS <laughs> is you get all of your updates in one big go. And right. I mean one really big go, like you move to a whole new OS. Whereas rolling is a lot of little changes frequently. Absolutely. And no matter what uh, distro you choose to go with, um, first and foremost, say it with me, uh, dedicated home. Uh, you, <laughs> you'll thank me later because yeah, no we'll, uh, you will forget to uh, back something up and kick yourself. Yeah, yeah. But by having dedicated home, your life's going to suck a whole lot less. Hey, 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 so, hey, maybe we yeah. should be recommending OpenSUSE 13.1. It's got, uh, it's an evergreen oh, yeah. release, three years of support. It automatically you know recommends a home partition for software availability. You've got software.opensusa.org. Yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, maybe this is an opportunity for I, th- no I think need- I agree. Yeah, yeah, no need to pronounce my name correctly. Go go check out OpenSUSE 13.1. I, ac- I actually think this is your perfect solution. I think th- I, I'm going to agree with that because it's kind of a balance of bo- both the best of both worlds. You can actually try something new and cool, but at the same time, it's really, really easy to use. Yeah. So And yeah. and Yast is, is a pleasure if you're not super oh, comfortable yeah. with Linux. Um, and you're going to discover things you didn't even know you could do. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> really- go check out the one-click installs for the software yeah. you need, and uh, I think you'll be pretty happy. And because yeah. they got three years' support... I think that's just right. For somebody who doesn't want something that changes that often, but you don't want to get too stale, I think that's the sweet spot. And you got your package access, which you got to love that. And you got your sugar daddy who's keeping the project alive long term. That's right. So there's uh-huh. advantages there uh-huh. too. So very yes. good. All right, Matt. Well, I think that'll bring us to the end of this week's Linux Unplugged. Now, you know, sir, of course, we love to give people's feedback. Yes. So they can go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. They can pop that contact link and then choose Linux Unplugged or Linux Action Show. We'll take them both. Send that in to us, and we'll read it on the next week's show. And, of course, we want you to join us live. You can go to jblive.tv on a Tuesday afternoon. You can also join our Mumble Room if you go over there. We put all the details in our live chat room over at jblive.tv or jblive.info. Timing for that can be found over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. So you can go over there and get it updated in your, in your neck of the woods. Well, Matt, I'll see yes. you on Sunday for the big show, okay? See you Sunday. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next week.